Okay, so we're talking about, um, you know, seeing the unseen God. I, I really meant to call the seeing the unseen. Some people think the word invisible is the same. It kind of is. But uh, but anyway, that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, it's a topic that's always interested, very been very interesting to me for a long time. So there is a general book on it. I mean, there's many books on it, but this is like a general read. If you want to get go further on the topic, um, you can look that up on Amazon or whatever. <clears throat> Seeing the Unseen God by John Davis. I'm not going to use all his material, but I mean, I'm going to mention maybe a few things from it, some of my own things. But if you want to go deeper, that's a good start. Um, certainly plenty of books on a lot of things I'm going to be talking about tonight. Plenty of resources out there. <clears throat> but uh Anyway, so when we think about God, you know, when we, the gap between God and man, we talk about knowing God and his attributes, who he is. Um, there's always been a, one, one of the things we've always mentioned in our theological studies or just biblical theology is what we call God's incomprehensibility. And that means that, um, there's always a gap between us and God because we're finite humans and God is the infinite one, right? He doesn't have any limits. He's eternal. He's uncreated. He's He doesn't have any struggles or problems or limitations. I mean, he is a, uh, you know, there's a gap between us and God, obviously. That's why, as we always say, we're finite. And he's not fine. He's the infinite one, as I just said. So um, in some ways, you know, some people would say like God's incomprehensible, like we can't fully comprehend him. Okay. But we can apprehend him. Okay. And that means that he has to, in order for us to know about God, God's going to have to condescend, meaning that he's going to have to humble or, or somehow provide a way for us to even know what he's like. He's going to have to do something because there's this gap between us and him. And we don't really get to demand put demands on God how he's going to reveal himself to us. We don't get to tell God that, you know, you get to reveal yourself to humans in this way, and you have to do it this way. So God chooses the way he wants to communicate, how he wants to reveal himself to humanity. That's what revelation is. We call it revelation, right? Something that was hidden and now it's revealed. Not the book of revelation necessarily, but just in general, what we mean by revelation. So, God is technically both hidden and revealed because, you know, he doesn't, in some ways you read the Bible, some places it seems like he's hiding in other places. He's really, he's there. He's very, very clear and very revealed in some ways. So, but he certainly has chosen what he wants to reveal about himself to us. It's his prerogative. It's his initiative. Okay. So one thing that we know about God from studying scripture and studying um, you can even study God outside of scripture and creation. If you just study uh, the, the way everything in the world is dependent on something and everything's contingent on something because the world is a physical, everything in the world is physical. Um, there's a physical creation, a physical universe, right? And we're physical beings. Of course, we have a soul too. But the point is that the God's different from us and God's not composed of anything material. Um, he's not made of any matter. Uh, material substance okay he doesn't have parts he's not put together um so when someone says what caused god they're just confusing god's nature they don't understand what the nature of god is his essence okay they're they're confused um when they say what caused god or where god come from they're assuming that someone put god together or something else put god together right because if god got put together by something else that means he would have parts and physicality right because everything Everything in my room right now has physicality to it. It all has parts. My bed's put together. My table's put together by something that has parts. I can measure it. I can weigh it, right? But that's not the way God is. He's a different kind of being. So he's a immaterial being, and he's not seen, and he's invisible. I mean, kind of synonym for not being seen is invisibility. Um, but we see in Scripture that there's certainly plenty of passages that say— <clears throat> That it's interesting, you know, people, there's passages that say, now these all have to be studied in context, of course, but I don't have time to go to the passage and read the entire context. But 
there's passages that talk about how the Father, God the Father, has never been seen. Where it just says God, right? Like John 1 18 says, No one has seen God. Jesus says, No one has seen God at any time. Um, or the author John says that. Um, there's a passage in Deuteronomy 4 12 that says, Then the Lord spoke to you from the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form, only a voice. Um, John 5 37 kind of s- says a similar thing. Jesus says, You have not seen his form. Um, of course, Colossians 1 15 says, you know, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Um, And then 1 Timothy 1.17 says, to the keen, eternal, immortal, invisible. 1 Timothy 6.16 says, no man has ever seen or can see. You have to read on there. 1 John 4.12 says, no one has seen God at any time. 1 John 4.2 says, how can we, how can he love God who he has not seen? So there's a lot of passages that use the language like no one has seen God. So it kind of depends what we mean by see. You know, what does that mean, see God? Does it mean to see him directly, like you look at another person? Does it mean um, not to see, you know, um, his essence, like I talked about his essence, what he is, his essence? So we'll talk more about this. <clears throat> um, but remember, in order to be an infinite being, God must be a spirit, okay? If he had a physical body, or God was a physical entity, then he couldn't be, he, he'd be, he'd have limits. Just like Jesus, you know, when Jesus took on human flesh, he had limits, right? Because now he's restri- he's constricted to a physical environment. He can't be more one place at one time. He can't be omnipresent, right? Because Jesus was not a spirit. He was a physical man, right? Now he was fully God and fully man, but he still was limited by human frailty and human um human issues right he bled he suffered he got tired you know so anyway but god the father as far as we know you know is is spirit okay now um so you know just like reading when we say god is spirit in some way we're saying god is like unseen or he's invisible okay that's why colossians 115 calls god the invisible god um, just to read that passage in more detail, 1 Timothy 6, 13 to 16, it says, I charge you for God who gives life to all things in Christ Jesus, who made the good confession before Pontius Pilate, to obey this command without fault or failure until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is appearing the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who, reveal at the right, who will reveal at the right time. He alone possesses immortality and lives in an unapproach, unapproachable light whom no man has ever seen or is able to see, to him be the honor, eternal power, amen. Okay, now then we get into, you know, how did people see God in the Old Testament? There's a lot going on in the Old Testament, obviously, a lot before Jesus, you know, Jesus shows up in the New Testament, things are a little easier, right? Because, okay, here's Jesus, he's fully God and fully man. So this is this is different. You know, we're going back in the Old Testament because God, certainly reveals himself progressively over time, right? He reveals more of himself. And then, of course, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. You know, all the fullness of deity dwelt dwelt in Jesus, right? The fullness of God dwelt in Jesus. So, anyway, but the Old Testament is a little different. Um, we know that we have a couple of passages, like with Moses, when, you know, he requests to see God's glory, Right. And then God tells him, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you and proclaim my name, the Lord in your presence. But you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. And then to protect Moses, you know, we see God put him in a cleft in a rock. Right. And covered his hand as he passed by. Right. And then God promised, I will remove my hand. You will not see my back, but my face must not be seen. You know, that's um, Moses really. I, I think Moses is a little ignorant, of course, of God's essence, who he is. Moses is obviously just like us. He's a finite human learning who God is. But I think Moses requested that because he wanted to be closer to God. I don't think he's trying to like test God, like, show me who you are. I want to see your glory. I don't, I think he's just wanting to be closer to God. That's why he requests that. And obviously God gives him a response. Now, what you see though, is that, um, you know, if God is spirit, God the Father is spirit, he's not physical at all. Uh, we know that 
<clears throat> you know, Mo, in one passage, there's where Moses speaks to God face to face, right? In Exodus 33, 11. Um, and, you know, you could take that a couple ways, which we'll talk more about. It could be a theophany. Um, a theophany is God appearing in some kind of form, whether it be an angel or a voice or a burning bush or um, the cloud or whatever. Okay. Um, but what, what you see a lot through scriptures, you see where are called anthropomorphisms, you know, when, which are human qualities that are applied to God, right? When we hear those words like face, hand, and back, you know, God says, like I said back here, God says, you know, I covered it. You know, God says, I promise I'll remove my hand. God says that, and you will not see my back, et cetera. Um, those are anthropomorphisms, okay? Um, you know, they're probably not literal because that's an anthropomorphisms are not literal. They're ways to describe God, like God has an outstretched arm, right? God doesn't have a literal outstretched arm, right? And so some of them are metaphorical, but the point is that um, that Moses is requesting, you know, to be close to God. He was close to God. You know, when he spoke face to face, he's not he's not seeing God like it's not literally um, face to face. Like it's not it's not like it's a figure of speech, right? Indicating that Moses and God were like in close communion. It's like two humans speaking to each other, but it's not literal like God's face is right there. He's talking to Moses like you're like a human would talk, right? Like we go face to face. It's it's more of a figure of speech. Okay. Now, Moses is certainly, what we see when God says, you cannot see me and live, but what God tells Moses and Moses, you know, you're forbidden from seeing God or seeing him directly, you know, not because of physical sightings forever possible, but a full unmediated exposure to God's essence. And what I mean by God's essence is his nature, what he is. Okay. We say like God is spirit. Okay. That's his essence. Humans' essence, we are physical and and spirit. We're we're matter and spirit because we're we have a dual nature, but God doesn't have that, right? Okay, God the Father, He He's just pure spirit. Okay. And so his essence can't be seen. No one can see God's essence. Okay. You, you can't, it's impossible. So, you know, I think an analogy would be like if you stare straight at the sun straight on try it one day, your eyes will just burn out, right? And you lose your sight. Just take that, the way the, what the sun does to our eyes, multiply that by like a million with God. You know, what would happen to us if we tried to be right in front of his, you know, experience his essence? It's just not possible, okay? So because God is totally different, like I said, his essence is totally different. He's got to pick a way to communicate to us. It's his, it's his work, okay? We don't get to demand a God tell God or order him around, like, you need to show me your essence or glory. You know, he doesn't know. That's not going to work. Okay, so, um, like I said, these anthropomorphisms are when Scripture assigns human characteristics to God, right? When, you know, that prayer that Moses prays, may the Lord keep you, may he bless you, may his face shine on you, the ironic benediction, you know, his face, right? That's not literal, like his face, right? It's anthropomorphic language assigned to God, or he stretched out his hand, like I said, or scattered his enemies with a strong arm. There's a lot of anthropomorphic language, right? Mostly in the Old Testament, okay? A lot of it in the Old Testament. Now, you have some other passages, like here, there's another couple examples, like in Exodus 24, it says that Moses went up with Aaron, Nabat, Nabat and Abihu, and the 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw God of Israel and under his feet, where there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself, yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they beheld God, and they ate and drank. So there we go. There it is again. See, the anthropomorphic language, okay? He, you know, God stretched out his hand, and they beheld God. It doesn't mean they, like, saw God directly, like his essence, right? Another one, Numbers 14 to 13 to 14. It says, Moses said to the Lord, when the Egyptians hear it, for you brought up this people by your power from among them, they'll tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among his people, that you are, are seen face to face. 
that your cloud stands over them, that you will go before them by day in a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire by night. So there it is again, right? This, this anthropomorphic language and also some the theophanies, okay, where God is going to uh, to be in a, a pillar of fire by night, right? That's not that's God using something to reveal himself and like he's using that pillar of fire, okay? But um, the cloud, you know, leads them. But obviously that's God manifesting himself through a cloud, right? But they don't see God directly, okay? Um, it doesn't mean God has physical eyes, right? And, and the Jewish people saw his eyes, right? Okay. Now, you do see there's certainly passages in the Old Testament. There's a lot of passages where the um, there seems to be someone being seen, meaning that Abraham has experiences where he sees someone, he's called the Lord. In, like in Genesis 12, 7, you know, it says the Lord appeared to Abraham. Genesis 17, 1, the Lord appeared to Abraham. You know, Genesis 18, 1, the Lord appeared to him. You know, you have the two angels, right, that come to greet him and Sarah, right? It says one's called the Lord, right? And, you know, in, in Hebrew, in the passive, it's the passive form of the verb to see, okay? And you find this in other places. You know, there's there's some other places, like with Isaac, you know, Genesis 26, 2, it says, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt, settled in the land. I'll point out to you, you know, Gen Genesis 26, 24, the Lord appeared to him that night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I'm with you. So... You know, you see this language of God appear or the Lord appear. So you know, there's always been this debate over who is this, who is this, you know, who is this figure? Um, and, you know, the problem is it goes like this, you know, so if you see the passages in the Old Testament or you see the Bible where I showed you before, I said, God, the father is unseen. I mean, no one has ever seen God, the father. Okay. But people are seeing something in the Old Testament. They're seeing these figures, and they're called the Lord. So a lot of people make an inference, and they say, well, that must be Jesus. Because, you know, no one has ever seen God the Father, and it must be God the Son. Um, who else can it be? I mean, you know, it can't be God the Father, because that would contradict other passages where it says, you know, no one can see God the Father. So who is it? So what view is that um, it's Jesus? Um, that they're they're theophanies. Um, some people call them Christophanies. I don't I don't really think they're Christophanies, but um, they're, it's debated, obviously. So that word theophany, even though it's not in the Bible, it just means like visible or audit auditory manifestations of God. So they these theophanies appear to men, so God could communicate. Okay, so you know there's there's debate on this. Um, for example, like um, when you read this book, Who, Who Ate Lunch with Abraham, like this author thinks is definitely Jesus. It's a pre-incarnate pre Christ. That's who it is in the Old Testament. You know, he's taking on human form in the Old Testament, the form of the angel. Um, Andrew Malone on the right, he takes kind of a more careful view. He says, it, it's really hard sometimes to distinguish this angel um it's hard to say it's some sort of divine figure, but it's hard to say exactly who it is. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a little up in the air. Um, but some people obviously have taught for years in church history. It's definitely a pre-incarnate Christ. I, I don't think you can be dogmatic about that. Um, certainly it's possible, but I just, I'm not going to say I'm a hundred percent certain. Um, you know, there's other places, you know, when you think about Genesis 32, 22 to 32, where Jacob wrestles with someone, right, who later is revealed to be God, right? You know, and Jacob says, I saw God face to face, and yet my life was fair. So Jesus is wrestling with this physical figure of some kind. So, you know, Jacob didn't get to see God in all his glory, but it was some sort of theophany, some sort of manifestation of God in human form. So... There are places, obviously, that when you read about the theophanies, these appearances like the angel of the Lord, they have divine characteristics. They 
you know, they, they can, they have the authority to judge and they're doing the same things. Some ways are given the same kind of authority that God has. Um, so, you know, they're definitely a divine figure of some kind. Um, so, you know, I, I think that there's an argument you could make for them being Jesus. I just don't think you can be dogmatic about it. It's certainly some form of some kind of divine figure. Um, you know, it, it's just, you know, and, and when you get back to this, when you go back to the beginning, when I said that, uh, nobody has seen God at any time, no one has seen his form. He's the image of the invisible God. So, you know, what, in some ways you'd have to ask, you know, what does this mean? You know, does this mean no one can see God in all his essence? Does this mean no one can see God in any way whatsoever? What does that even mean? Um, so the point is, though, God seems to allow himself to be seen in the Old Testament through these theophanies, okay? The question becomes, what are the theophanies? You know, is it Jesus? Is it just an, an angel, a divine being of some kind? I, You know, there's some arguments on both sides. There's some sort of theophany there, right, where God manifests himself in some way, just like he manifests himself through the cloud, the pillar, the fire, you know, the cloud guiding him, you know, he's doing this through some sort of physical being. Okay. Um, now, you know, like in Judges 13, 1 to 23, you know, Samson's parents have an interaction with the angel of the Lord, right? Um, they don't really realize it's the angel of the Lord until the angel performs a sign, right? And ascends to heaven before their eyes. And, you know, at one point in Samson's father, figures out who it is and he's scared he says we're doomed he said we have seen god that's what he said so you know um it's hard to tell but uh you know it's obviously some sort of angelic figure okay so you know i could do a whole call on angels in the bible we could do that as a separate call but there's some sort of revelation of god in these physical beings you know some sort of theophany Okay. But some people, like I said, are dogmatic about it. They say it's a Christophany. They say it's Jesus. Um, I think it's possible, but I'm not, I'm not going to be dogmatic about it. Um, you notice this is interesting, like in Isaiah 6, 1 to 13, where Isaiah has that vision. You see that God's sitting on the throne. And uh, you know, Isaiah obviously you know, sees his sin. He says, woe to me, I'm ruined, man of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. So, you know, this is like Isaiah in a vision of some kind, right? He's not, it's, you know, vision is where your mind, you know, is um, having this experience, right? A subjective vision, okay? And, you know, then, of course, Isaiah gets his calling there. But, you know, it's interesting in the book of John 12, John 12, 41, John says Isaiah actually saw Jesus there. He says that in John 12, 41. John appoints that person to be Jesus. The Lord is Jesus there. It's kind of interesting, right? So anyway. Now, um, you ever thought about like, what is it that would make us die? Like, why is it we can't handle an all-consuming interaction with god where we see him in all his glory um is it just so intense that you know our bodies wouldn't be able to handle it probably um you know we'll get new resurrection bodies one day we'll be in eternity with god so he's obviously going to do something to us we can be in a heavenly place with him and we can be in heaven and earth with, or be on the new earth with him he's going to do something to our bodies um but obviously the issue comes down to holiness of god too you know, probably his holiness is beyond anything we can probably comprehend, right? How set apart he really is, and our sinfulness simply cannot handle it. Now, in Jewish thinking, um, you know, one of the reasons Jews have such a problem with Jesus, when we say Jesus, uh, you know, God took on human form in Jesus, or we say the incarnation, or we say you know, that Jesus was or is God, whatever. They have such a problem with that because their history, you know, God warned them very clearly, you know, about not taking the graven image, right? Exodus 24, you know, not taking 
It says, do not make yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that's heaven above or on earth below in the water under the earth. Do not bow down to them. Don't let anyone make you serve them. For I, Adonai, your God, am a jealous God, bringing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of third and fourth generations of those who hate me, for showing loving kindness to thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So, as you know, this is one of the prohibitions in Israel's history. So they had a problem with idolatry all around, right? All around the world, all around that area were false gods. You know, you had all kinds of Egyptian gods and pagan gods and Canaanite gods. And so obviously God was trying to set them apart. You know, in, in Israel, the Jews have been in Egypt, Egypt for a long time. They've been exposed to that idolatry. So, you know, God's forming them as a people and he's showing them, you know, don't worship any other gods. Don't worship any of these other gods, right? Don't make yourself a graven image or try to make me into some kind of form. So that's why Jews have such a problem with, you know, with Jesus sometimes, you know, um, you know, Moses, you know, if you read Deuteronomy 4, 9 to 20, that passage there, you know, Moses informs the Israelites that when God appeared to them, he did not reveal himself in a physical form, only, it was only his voice. And so they didn't see any shape, right? But they only heard God's word, right? So they, you know, they knew all about this, that God would not take on human form. They're not allowed to worship God in any kind of form, okay? And like I said, they knew the civilizations around them, the pagans divinized everything, the sun, the moon, the sea, everything. Um, and, you know, this was part of Egypt, Egypt worship, Egyptian worship too, as I said, and you know, there are things that uh, to observe that can image God on earth, but there's only two things that can really image God. You know, when God says, let us make man in our image in Genesis 1, um, one way, the one primary way, the only thing that can image God being image of God is us, right? Because we're created in his image, but we're not to be worshipped, of course. But, you know, if someone says, "There's God has no images of himself, well, we are the image of God as humans, right? We don't show that image perfectly because we have the fall of man, but we're still creating his image. And that, that image stamp on us is still there, even if we don't recognize it. A lot of people don't recognize it. Um, but also, the only other way God has imaged himself is in the per person of the Messiah. Right now, Jesus is not created like us. But it says in Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, sometimes you notice Jehovah Witnesses like to take that passage and say that Jesus was created because he's the firstborn, right? That means Jesus was like a son. He was born. He, God had a son and he was created. That's not correct. Um, if you look up the firstborn imagery, go up, go to Psalm 89. It talks about the Davidic king is the firstborn. He's exalted highly. That Davidic king is the, um, you know, the the divine representative of God. But he's not, you know, Jesus is the Davidic king. That's what that means. There, he is the Davidic king. Okay, um, but he's not created. Okay, so the only people that have it, the only two people have imaged God, well, we can image God and Jesus has imaged God, but Jesus did it perfectly and we do it imperfectly. Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God, right? Okay. Now, the problem we've had, as you know, is when you're growing up as a kid and you try to picture God in your head, it's just natural, right? We all, we all do that. I don't know whether maybe Jews have more sensitivity to that because they teach their kids growing up that growing up that issue, but if you're not a believer and you're just like a nominal Christian kid or you just don't know much about the Bible, a lot of times you just try to picture God in your head. And usually it's a guy with a gray beard and the man in the sky. Um, but we know that trying to do this is just it distorts God, obviously. And we don't have any way of, you know, we, we really can't do it. It just doesn't work. Any representation will be incorrect. So. You know, it's just stupid, but we do it and pictures do it and people still do it in movies, right? We once had that movie, Bruce Almighty with Morgan Freeman as God, you know, he had gray hair too. Um, but, you know, what does God say in Isaiah 40, 18? He says, to whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? So there's just no way for us to um, to do that.
okay, and we run into problems. We try to do it. Now, um, when it says, like in Exodus 24, when it says you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth, okay? So those graven images, um, you know, obviously we think of like in the Bible things they carved out, right? Like the golden calf or the stone, wood, or metal images, right? And then the demon, I talked about, let's see how the demonic influence gets behind that thing, behind that statue or that, that, that physical thing, right? But also says, do not make God, don't make any, don't, do not carve, make himself yourself a card image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath. So, you know, we're also not to um, seek God, says we know, must not seek God visually represent him in any physical form that we can imagine. Okay. So you see how this is, it's, it's, it's interesting because you have this um, contrast. You've got, God's saying he has no form, don't worship any images, don't worship me in any form, blah, 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 blah. And then somehow in the Old Testament, there's some sort of form he takes on in those theophanies. He can do it if he wants to. But then Jesus comes along, and it says in the New Testament, he took on the form of God in Philippians 2. So see how God re reveals himself progressively, like he reveals himself in a you know in a greater way as he did in Jesus. So, but that's why Jews today sometimes have a problem with, which is jumping to Jesus and then saying God took on human form. Like, wait a minute, the Old Testament says this, right? Well, we can respond and say yes, it does say that, but there seems to be cases in the Old Testament where God appears in a theophany. Okay, so what are those? Is God totally restricted? He's restricted himself. He can't take on any kind of form at all. And remember, when he took on those forms, he didn't say, worship me. He didn't command to be worshipped or anything, but he seems like when he wanted to communicate something or do sometimes, he was able to, there was like, or there's like a theophany now, okay? So it's it's kind of interesting. Certainly, but the greater revelation moves on, the progressive revelation, then Jesus comes, right? So, like I say, kind of reiterate what I just said, God may take a visual form as he chooses and temporarily manifest himself to someone in what is known as a theophany, okay? Um, but for us to decide what visual form must represent him the best is an act of spiritual arrogance, okay, and it's transcendence. So, you know, we say God is transcendent. You know, that means he's completely set apart from all created things. He's utterly unique, right? Sometimes we say people are searching for something transcendent. That means something outside the created realm, something outside the physical world. They want something that transcends the physical world because the physical world is not satisfying them, right? Okay. Now, when it comes to, as we move on through the Bible, how we see God, um, it comes down an issue of communication. And if anybody's been a communication major or took a communications class, you know, you learn this. Of course, this is pretty obvious in life on a daily basis. You know, you have different kinds of communication. We have verbal communication, of course, when we speak with others. We have nonverbal communication, um, you know, through tone and body language, right? We have written communication through emails, texting, and letters, whatever that is. Then we have listening as a form of communication, just listening. Then we have visual communication where we use like imagery or symbols or something we made to communicate. Like if I, if I'm a painter and someone comes over to my house and I say, come look at this painting I did. Tell me what I'm trying to communicate. And you come over, you look at the painting and you see, I'm trying to express myself. And so I'm trying to express something or I'm trying to communicate what I'm thinking. Right. Sometimes you go into museums, right? You look at you look at pictures and you sometimes say, what is that, what is that painter trying to communicate? What is that artist trying to say through that visual communication, right? Okay, so keeping this in mind, um, you know, when people 
say, well, you know, can I see God? It depends how God decides to communicate with us, right? Because we know that everything we experience every day is using our five senses. What we see, what we hear, what we smell, touch, and taste, right? I mean, you live off your five senses all day long. So the question is, you know, are we going to be able to use these senses or use especially the sight sense? You know, can we can we really see God? I mean, we can't smell God. Um, we can't really touch God. We can't taste God. You could say, you know, you can hear God speaking through like the word of God, you know, when you're reading it or you hear a preacher or you hear one of your pastors speaking. You know, oh, I just heard God speak through that sermon today. Of course, some people think God talks to them all the time. He's constantly speaking to them apart from scripture all day long. And that's the main way God communicates. I don't like that approach. Um, I don't know why we went down that road in Christian theology. Um, I think that the main way God communicates is through the text. If he's going to just talk to us all day long apart from the text, why did he give us a text? Okay. And then you've got problems of well, is that God speaking? I don't know. Is it Satan? Is it my flesh? I don't know. I'm going to spend hours and hours trying to decipher who's speaking to me. And that's the way people make their decisions. And I find it to be infantile, in my opinion. But I'm kind of opinionated about that, as you see. So I'm not opposed to God speaking apart from the text. I think he can do whatever he wants to do. I just don't think that's the main way he guides us. And I think that we've kind of gone off track with that in our Christian discipleship. But there's a whole lot of people out there trying to live that way. And I, I don't see a lot of maturity in their lives in some ways, but we're talking about sight today. Um, the, you know, we're talking about seeing God. So we see God through us. Uh, I'm sorry. We see God through his visual communication. Okay. That means God does allow us to see him through the things, through imagery of the things he's made. Right. And this is, he's visually communicating. Like if someone says, I don't know if God exists, how do I know? Well, God communicates through us visually, like we do with humans. As humans, we use visual communication. God does it with us. You know, we can, Paul says it clear as day in Romans 1. You know, this is visual communication. You know, God says his invisible attributes have been clearly seen as eternal power and divine nature can be per perceived through what has been made. Okay, so, so notice that means God has communicated something visually, something we can observe, right? We can observe God's attributes by looking at the things he's made. We can know we can know some things about God by looking at creation, that he's eternal, he's powerful, he's personal, he's a thinking being, he's creative, right? But we don't learn everything about God through that passage, not at all. We have to read the whole Bible to know more about what God's like. But the point is that this is visual imagery visual communication we you know paul makes it clear that we can see this visual communication as clear as day you know that there's a god who made us or made everything you know we owe praise to him we owe thanks to him um and sadly the this this the way god is visually communicating to us is ignored by a lot of people and they suppress the truth they don't give thanks to god and then they're under condemnation you know, Paul says in that whole passage that the wrath of God has been revealed, right? The wrath of God has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness by the right unrighteousness to suppress the truth. What are they suppressing? They're suppressing the obvious thing that you can observe God through what he has made, okay, through the creation. It's clear as day. And then Paul says, but people don't want to because they don't want to honor God or give thanks to him, and they end up falling under judgment. And then God's passive wrath is revealed. Passive wrath is where God does not do the same things like he did to Sodom and Gomorrah and the flood and everything. This is passive wrath where God just says, hands off. Because you read the rest of Romans 1, God judges humanity, right? He just says, all right, here's what you want. You ignore me in creation. I reveal myself clear as day. Because you ignore me in creation through visual communication. What you can see, now I'm going to let you have what you want. You get to live without me and have your own way. And now we'll see how well that goes, right? And the world obviously is in a state of a Romans 1 condition, right? I talked about that before. Um, but, you know, we, we see God through his effects, 
Okay, we don't see him directly, but we see him through his effects. We can, you know, observe the universe, study the universe, the, the complexity of the universe, you know, had a beginning point. The universe is precisely set up for us to be here, <laughs> precisely set up for planet Earth to get going. You don't get planet Earth going until you have the right universe first. And an Earth like an Earth planet, and uh, the planet we need has to be set up a certain way to support and sustain life to get life going so we can observe that we can see god's visual communication we can study the dna code in our bodies how it's the complexity of it how it's in giant instruction manual there's a blueprint for the human cell you have a giant code in your body um, that is all this lettering if you've seen the letters of the dna code the sequencing of the genetic code it's just unreal um so you know, we see God's effects, his visual communication, right? That's how we know he's there. And also, God uses visual communication through observing humans. God created us, right? So when we visually see humans, we should see God. That's one of the main ways, another way we know that God is there. He's, he's communicating through humans. We're made in his image, right? God's a perfectly moral being, and we're not perfect, but we still have his moral imprint on us, his moral imprint on us, and we're still image bearers, even if we don't recognize it. But some aspects of God, we can't imitate. We're not, we're not going to be able to be infinite or self-existing or immutable, what we call God's non-commutable, incommutable attributes, meaning that God, these are unique to God and him alone. They can't be passed on to us. You know, we're not all powerful. We're not all knowing. We can't be everywhere. We're not, you know, without parts. God has no parts. That's what we call God's simplicity. He doesn't have any physical parts. Nothing put them together. And God is a necessary being, meaning nothing. He's not dependent on anything. We're content. We're contingent on things all day long to survive. We're contingent on the air. We're contingent on our health. We have contingencies with how other humans treat us, how things work out in the world around us, right? But God is not dependent on any of those things for his existence. He's a perfect, necessary being. So we can't we can't show God exists to other people. God can't communicate who he is through these attributes in us. That, that's for him. But he does speak to um, people can see or should see God in us as being image bearers and his moral attributes. Like we can be, we can imitate God in our truthfulness. We can try to live holy lives, not perfectly holy, but living holy lives, our mercy, our love and benevolence, righteousness, grace, goodness. Um, justice is another one I don't have on here when we we strive for justice because God, you know, is just. So we can certainly, people can should be able to see God in us when we imitate him in this way. We don't do it perfectly though, right? But you know, if you love someone unconditionally. That's totally radically different from the world around you. The world around you, everything's conditional, right? If you do this for them, they want you to do that for you. If you don't do that for them, they cut you off. They cancel you, right? If you do something wrong, they might cancel you. If you say something, the wrong thing, they might cancel you, right? So that's diff That's not the way it is with God, okay? So his love is unconditional, right? That's why he's so different. Okay. Um, so also... When, when we look at humans and God, you know, allows himself to be seen in the humans he's created, his visual communication, we see humans seem to care about moral values and moral duties. We all seem to be passionate about our moral beliefs. You know, some people have different values than others. Moral values are love, justice, mercy, kindness, whatever. I mean, there's different moral values, um, but we seem to have moral knowledge. You know, we... Like I talked about before, we we know there's a moral law that's being violated sometimes. That's why we want justice. We want things. We try to fight for others. And then we, of course, we seem to mostly think humans matter generally by the way we spend so much time fighting for rights, equality, and justice, right? So, you know, being made in the image of God, God reveals that to us that we seem to act like, not all, everybody treats humans like this, obviously, but... There's some sort of way we see, I see God in humans judging by how much they really, really fight for other humans. They must think they have dignity, value, and rights. If they're creating God's image, they do, but 
even some people don't recognize that they still fight for humans all the time. Um, and then of course we live as such meaning and purpose are important to us. And that shows us being created in his image as well. Right. He, people can see that is why do we create meaning and purpose? Why is it so important to us? Um, so, okay. Now, um, let's go back to the communication thing. So I mentioned, I've done a lot here on visual communication where God, we, God allows himself to be seen through the things he's made. Right. Um, but there's also visual and verbal communication together. Now, another way God visually communicates to us and verbally communicates to us is when he sends someone into the world. And of course we see this person and this person is an authorized spokesman for God. He is the one that God's picked to show what God is like. And of course that is Jesus because Jesus is the only one who took on human form, took on a human nature, took on an additional nature, right? Right. The father is not, the one who took on an additional human nature and the Holy spirit didn't as well. No one's seen the Holy spirit either, but Jesus did. Okay. And we know in the Bible that you just like it says in the, uh, the beginning of John, you know, it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. Glory is the only begotten from the father, full of grace and truth. So John is using that language there from the tabernacle when God would dwell with Israel. See that cloud going up there? That's supposed to be God, you know, his presence, I mean. And so that's what that word means. It comes from the Shekinah, glory of God, right? Um, you know, the Shekinah glory of God is seen throughout the Old Testament, right? It's It manifests itself in the light, fire, cloud, you know, in these, in these theophanies, right? The giving of the Torah, and then Paul, and what happens is John uses that to describe Jesus in John 1. This is the, Jesus is the glory of God, right? And he tabernacled among us. You know, literally means that Jesus came to tabernacle among his people, okay? Um, now, when Paul says in Colossians 1.15, he says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Um, we know that, as I said, that God, when he created humanity, he made them in his image. And God made us as representatives um, in his creation, right? Now, Jesus comes along, and Paul's talking about her in Colossians 1.15. Remember, Jesus is the exact representation of God, but he is the perfect image bearer, as I said, the perfect image bearer. We, we try to image God, and we don't do it perfectly, right? We sin still. But Paul's saying, you know, that Jesus is the image, the perfect image, the perfect representative in God himself as well. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting passage, right? Colossians 1.15. Now, when Paul says here, he also says something, Colossians 1.16, he says, by him all things are created that are in heaven on earth. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created through him and for him. So, you know what Paul's saying there? He's saying everything we observe in creation, which is the animals, nature, the oceans, the sky, the stars, everything. Um, that is all the handiwork of Jesus. Okay? Because Jesus here, it says... Everything was created through Jesus and for him. Okay? So the visible part of the creation are things that we can't see, right? Those are those are things in the spiritual realm that um, are not, you know, we can't see physically, right? We, we can't see angels and demons and, I mean, some people think they've seen them, I know, but there's an invisible realm we can't see, right? Because we, we're, we're restrained by the physical realm. Okay, but obviously, we can be aware of the spiritual realm. That's what God does with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying you can't discern evil or discern things in the immaterial realm. I'm not saying you have no, you, you, you know, like if you sense a demonic presence or something, I'm not saying that's not possible. I'm just saying you don't, 
we don't necessarily see everything there. We can't. Okay. I can't see the invisible war all around me. It's going on in the principalities of darkness, like Paul talks about in Ephesians 6. I see the effects of it. Now, obviously, God, one way we see <laughs> where God visually communicates um, is certainly through miracles. You know, he visually communicates. When God says, I want to get your attention, you know, C.S. Lewis once said, if God exists, miracles are on the table, right? If God exists, then definitely miracles are possible. But when God's trying to get Israel's attention or the world's attention, he does something huge. Obviously, creation is the first miracle, right? Creation out of nothing. And if that miracle happened, all miracles are on the table because nature can't make nature. It needs something outside of nature to, to make the universe, and that would be God. So creation is the first miracle, and then we see God revealing himself, communicating to Israel through the deliverance out of Exodus, right? I mean, in the Exodus out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea. Then I think the flood... There's some miracles at there's some miraculous aspects of the flood, I think is, you know, that's God communicating visually, obviously. And then, of course, Jesus in his resurrection is the, um, you know, is his, uh, you know, is God communicating as well, where people can see Jesus, what he did and the impact of his resurrection. So God's saying, listen up, I'm doing something in world history. That's what miracles are. So he is visually communicating and then. I think also verbally communicating through those miracles, both. Now, there are some good resources on what God's doing in today's world. You know, I don't, we don't want to make it sound like all these miracles are in the past and God's not doing anything today. Just kind of after the resurrection, he just kind of went to sleep and says, hands off. I'm not doing any miracles anymore until Jesus comes back. But there are some really good stories and testimonies of things that have happened around the world, not just the U.S., because a lot of times the U.S. is a little more rationalistic, and we're not as open to the supernatural. We're not open as much to the miraculous as we've seen other third world countries and things, but J.P. Moreland and uh, Craig Kinnear have both written books on this, so God is certainly doing really, really amazing things in today's world. We just don't see it sometimes. We're not looking for it. Now, Obviously, I've done a whole presentation on miracles and how to define a miracle, but that's a topic for another time. But anyway, so what are miracles supposed to do when a miracle happens, when God does that, you know, whenever God's speaking or doing something visually, God's revealing himself, and then there's supposed to be a response. We're supposed to listen to God and submit to him, right? We're supposed to give him all the work, make him worthy of worship and yield ourselves over to him. That's why Jesus did miracles. You know, the goal is to get them to believe, but also to actively obey him, to say, follow me, you know, follow Jesus. It wasn't just, they weren't just done for entertainment, right? Now, what about the passage in Matthew 5, 8, where it says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Um, you know, that's the context of that's a sermon on the mount, right? All through Matthew 5 to 7 is a sermon on the mount. But it doesn't mean, doesn't necessarily mean that we physically see God face to face, right? When you when I first read that as a new Christian, I was like, oh wow, if I'm pure in heart, I'll get to see God. Like, is he gonna like show up in my bedroom? I just didn't know any better because I was ignorant of the Bible. But that's not what that means. Um, it has to, it really means to be closer to God, right? To be satisfied in God. We'll find satisfaction in God when we live pure lives, when we have a pure disposition towards God, when our heart is pure, and we really, really want to make God the, um, we want to be satisfied in God. We want to make God the ultimate, where he should be. God should be the ultimate. And when we look to all the things in this world to be the ultimate, they just fall up short, right? They fall short, then we get dissatisfied. And so that's why people are looking for the ultimate, and they can't get it in this world. They can't get it through possessions. They can't get it through relationships. They can't get it through their job, skills, everything. They just, well, abilities, they just keep trying, you know, it's like a, it's like a uh, mice on the, a mouse on the, um, in the circle going around, and they're that little machine. It just keeps going. 
doesn't stop. And so people try to feed off the creation. They try to just look for the ultimate constantly. And they, they, they're looking for the infinite, something without limits. But they're, they, they keep falling short because they're caught up by finite things, things that don't satisfy. And so when we're looking for God, I mean, when we're, we're pure in heart and we really have the right disposition towards God, you know, God will do something in our hearts to find soul, full satisfaction in him. You know, there's another word for pure in heart. You know, we talk about being, it's like being blessed. Like what Jesus says, blessed are, you know, blessed can be translated happy. It's like a state of contentment. You know, we have this joyful state of being in God, like we're content. Okay, there's nothing else <clears throat> that makes us content except God, Right. And that's a good place to be. That's something to strive for, obviously. I mean, it's, it has to be done daily, but it certainly can be achieved. You know, and Jesus says very clearly that those who see God really have to have the right disposition. You know, he says that, you know, that God shows himself, makes himself known to infants, right? To the humble. Okay, he doesn't, the things he... He hides things from the wise, the arrogant, right? But he reveals himself to the humble, the infants, the children, right? Then, you know, we're called to have a humble, this people that put demands on God, saying, you know, God needs to prove himself to me, and I am not going to believe till he shows me a sign, and God has to give me absolute 100% certainties there. You're not getting it, okay? That's not the, that's not the right disposition to come to God. Okay, you've, you've got to have a humble heart like a child. That doesn't mean to be naive and silly. It just means to be have the right disposition. And we know the ultimate reason, as I said last week, that people can't see God in any capacity, meaning they can't see God's work in the world around them. They can't, they make rationalizations about God. They make rationalizations about Jesus they stay really busy and try to stay busy and get busier and busier and just try to be, they're all, always distracted, distracted by something, whether it be their phone or technology, there's spiritual blindness, right? And Satan uses this, you know, because second Corinthians four, three, six, as I said last week, you know, it says the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. So he can't see the light of the good news. And so we, we need to give people the good news. So share the good news so they have new glasses to see, right? We want to give them a set of new glasses so they'll see reality differently. And seeing God first, where you see reality through the eyes of God, obviously changes everything. It changes the way you see everything. That's why, as I said before, you know, Christianity is not just a relationship with Jesus when you die. It's about a worldview. It's about the way you see reality. Once you come to faith in the Messiah, you get a new set of glasses on, you get to see reality really differently, right? And you get to see all of reality differently, okay? So I hope that uh, provokes some thought. That's about it. And we can talk now 